Uh, hello, my name is Bernardo Moira uh, Costa. Uh, I'm Brazilian and I work for Standard Cognition in San Francisco. Uh, so this talk is going to focus on what has been my pet project at the company for the past, I guess, year or so. Uh, it'll start with a little bit of history and then go forward with NeoBuffer, which is the project in question. Um, so here's my information if you want to reach out to me eventually. Uh, so I put this outline here just to help out. So we're going to go into the motivation requirements, other things we looked into, and then all the different characteristics of this uh, project. Uh, so to begin with motivation, uh, our name is Standard Cognition, and we're an autonomous checkout company. Uh, basically, what this means is this uh, idea of you walk into this store, you grab whatever it is that you want, and then you walk out, and you are checked out. You get charged for what you picked up. Kind of this seamless experience for shopping. Um, we're hiring, so if anyone is interested, talk to me. Um, so the motivation is this, and, and this is the problem that was proposed to me on my first day. Um, we deal with a lot of cameras. So we have in San Francisco a very small test store. Uh, so there's a picture of it. And so the store is about 170 meters squared. And for this tiny store, we're talking convenience store sized, we have 27 total cameras. And that's a little bit not enough. Uh, so this scales up sort of linearly. So if we were to use our system on a very large store, like uh, uh, in Europe, I guess, a Lidl, or uh, in the US, like Walmart, we're talking at least 100 cameras, possibly more. And then again, the bigger the store, the more cameras you're talking about. Uh, another issue we have is we do a lot of experiments. So for, for us to be able to test our system, the most reliable way is to get people to go and shop. Um, a lot of the time, the people who shop are the people who are running experiments. But sometimes you need more people than the people working on that particular uh, project. So I got a picture of one particularly large experiment. These are all people that work with me. Uh, so basically, to run a really, really large experiment, you either have to hire a bunch of actors, which is expensive and annoying, or you have to mobilize the entire company and say, everyone, we're going to fake shop for 30 minutes, OK? Uh, <laughs> and it is very annoying when you're like trying to track down some obscure bug and someone is like, do you want to fake chop Cheerios for 10 minutes for me? And you don't want to say no, because you might need it too someday, and you want them to help you out. Um, so basically, what we want is, how do we multiplex these video streams so that five people can run the same different experiments at the same time using the same uh, experiment setup? So you have people shopping once and feeding into five different whatever it is that you're testing downstream. Um, and then on top of that, how do we unify the API to, for controlling these distinct cameras? Um, so for us, you know, we, I, I mentioned the, the previous slide, like we have an office in Tokyo and an office in the US. This by itself, just from the fact that we're doing US and Japan, means we have different cameras. Uh, so just because of how the frequency of the power, the mains line is, means that cameras are going to try to behave differently to avoid weird effects where the frame rate is happening together with the flicker of the light. That's just one wonderful thing about video. The more I've learned about video, the worse it gets. Uh, but so we wanted to, to like create this unified API. Like I, the consumer of whatever video streams, I don't want to bother what type of camera it is that I'm using. I want to know that there are certain calls that I can make that it'll, it'll work in a way that's expectable. I gave an example yesterday uh, at dinner with some other people. So we were using this camera from a manufacturer who I shall not name, uh, where the API, the HTTP API that provided us for like setting focus and things like that, uh, didn't do bounce checking on the focus. So I was testing the focus from the API until I broke the camera, because it, <laughs> it exploded the lens. Uh, so, you know, just wonderful lot all, all around. You want to, you want to figure these things out on like a unified level. Um, so my solution to this was this, uh, program called sensor D or cam D. Uh, I called it sensor D at first, but there's already some weird system D thing called sensor D. So then I renamed it to cam D and one of my coworkers says, that sounds like an old person name that I hate it. So I just left it both. Uh, if anyone has a nice name idea, please come talk to me. 
Uh, so ChemD is this daemon, this server, that will work as an inter intermediate bef between consumers and uh, the actual cameras. Uh, it's all written in Rust. And yeah, it's basically just a camera daemon. There's, uh, there's a similar project that's uh, open source from, I think, GNOME people. Uh, but it's different in basically the requirements. Uh, so clients use ZMQ to talk to it. There's like a protocol that's defined in, an, this is all closed source, but it's defined in this internal crate. It's very simple to use. Uh, and we have cl clients live for Rust since some of our stuff is in Rust and for Python since some of our stuff is in Python. Uh, it's a pretty large Rust project. So the whole thing clocks in at about 7,500 lines of Rust together with the supporting libraries. But the more important part, and the, outcome, the reason I'm mentioning this will become clearer later, is it's a small part of a pretty huge system. So an addendum, so originally I, I wrote this talk in uh, LaTeX, and I had uh, planned for a 16 by nine aspect ratio, but then I realized it's four by three, so the image doesn't work as well, but nonetheless. So this is a, a graph that I built with GraphVis of our entire system with empty nodes. So you might see it doesn't fit, but at the, very top, there's a node that's actually named, that's CAMD. All the rest is other stuff. Um, and that's like 7,000 lines of Rust. So it gets pretty gnarly. Uh, again, we'll come back to this. Um, one challenge was clear from day one, and I procrastinated on it for about a year, uh, which was basically, how do we get CAMD to talk to the client processes and transfer the actual video? Uh, because it works as a daemon, it means it's in a different uh, process than whatever clients it's talking to. And while, you know, cross-thread communication and channels are pretty, you know, mundane and rust, cross-process channels are not. In my head, I was like, oh, someone has done this before. I'll forget about it. I'll do everything else, and I'll come back to this. Horrible mistake. Never do it. Uh, so whatever channel we knew we were gonna use had a few requirements that became clear as the project went on. Uh, so it had to be fast. So as I mentioned, we have about 27 cameras in that tiny store. This ramps up to about 100 or maybe even more depending on the size of the store. Uh, so it has to be very fast. We don't want the channel to be the bottleneck ever because the bottleneck should be the machine learning system, which is always the slowest part. Um, because it has to be fast, for me, this basically means whatever channel data structure we're using has to be lock free. Um, and I've heard some sort of like confusion about what exactly people mean when they say lock free. For me, lock free means it uses atomics. Doesn't mean anything else. Uh, it has to be flexible and I mean this in two ways. Uh, first, so this is a cut version of that previous large graph. Uh, the boxes show different processes. So there's a pink box, which is one process and a pr uh, blue box, which is another process. Uh, it's a part of that huge graph. Realistically, this whole thing could be written in Rust, and we're in the process of doing that right now. Parts of it are in Python, parts of it are in Rust. And we would want that all of the cross-process communications so through all these lines that cross the boxes here are using this channel X, whatever it is. Uh, so it has to be flexible to support not only images for video, but whatever data is going on through these channels and whatever we might need. On top of this, it means it has to also work cross-thread if we wanted to, and, and cross-process, of course, and also within the same process if you, really, if you really want to use it that way. So another thing that is nice since we're using Rust is we want this thing to be safe, or at least as safe as possible. One lesson from coding in cross-process like settings is you have to kind of forego some of your luxuries. Uh, n nothing you do will ever be like perfectly safe because you're kind of crossing the boundary of the introspection of the compiler inside of your code, like at a certain point, because you're making assumptions about an entirely different program running. Um, Multi-consumer for us is a necessity, again, because of that need to multiplex those streams into parallel experiments. And, you know, it became clear, um, we needed to find a solution for this, otherwise nothing would work. Um, so there's not a lot of images in this presentation. The reason is I spent my entire CGI budget on this one Pokemon joke, so I need people to like it, okay? Otherwise, it'll feel like a waste of 20 bucks on Fiverr. Um, 
So we looked into SDD lib channels. Of course, they don't work. Not cross process. Forget about it. Uh, Crossbeam is really nice, but it doesn't quite aim to do what we want it to do. RB is uh, just a crate for a ring buffer. We thought about how we could adapt it, but it also wasn't quite there. Ring buff, another crate, didn't quite cut it as well for a number of reasons. And then eventually the answer became clear. Uh, it's NeoBuffer, this whole new thing. Uh, Jigglypuff is there just for comedic purpose. Uh, so NeoBuffer is written from scratch, all in Rust. It's a collaboration with Ikliog, Leo Gaspard, uh, and Nagiza, Simonas Kazalowskis, both work with me, Simonas, work, and I think Leo have contributed the compiler, Rust compiler at different times. Um, and it's been based on discussions with Eddie B and Amonio on IRC. So just to take a brief pause here, uh, I need to thank Leo for taking this from my ball of undefined behavior into a ball of safe behavior. Uh, and Simonas for really ironing out some of the parts that I didn't want to do and that Lee also didn't want to do, like figuring out the right atomic orderings on x86 for this thing to work. Uh, and also for Eddie B and Amonio for taking the time to literally have hour-long talks with me about how to do this kind of insane evil thing. Um, so a few components became used in this project with time. And I'm just going to talk about them because they're public. So on this slide in the, this section, there are going to be some links. Not all of them are public yet, so you can try and see. Uh, I haven't really checked Slack in the past couple of days, so I don't know if what how far along they are in open sourcing this. Uh, Leo and uh, Simone is in a rush to try to get it out before this talk. So we knew that you know we we need some sort of a uh, marker trait the same way we have for threads, but for processes, this doesn't exist yet. So we wrote a very simple crate with just proc sync and proc send, which are exactly what they sound. They're just like send and sync for threads, but they signify it for processes. Uh, ideally, some data would be merged into the standard library. So if anyone has thoughts or opinions on that, please come talk to me. Uh, it's This one I know is public, so you can go check it out. Again, there's not much there, just two marker traits. Uh, on top of this, you know, if you're doing cross-process, you know you're going to end up with shared memory somewhere. Uh, I found that there was no nice wrapper for using shared memory in Rust. At least I couldn't find any. So we wrote our own, this library called Shmem. I don't think this one is public yet. Uh, so it's a really nice ergonomic wrapper around shared memory. Basically, the way it works is it provides it with this shared struct. And when you call shared new with some data, It'll take ownership of that data, allocate shared memory space, and give you back the shared T or whatever T that is. Uh, and it keeps inside that struct, there's a file descriptor in there. And now there's a separate issue of, you know, the only way to do shared memory safely is for you to kind of rely on pathless files because you don't want someone to be messing with that data that shouldn't have access to it. You need like tight control around the file descriptors. Uh, so we use pathless files. So there's no path to these files that we're describing, which means you need some sort of special mechanism to be able to send this to another thread. You can't just tell them, like send them a string over a ZMQ and say, oh, open this file and the data will be there. Uh, so we use Unix domain sockets, which was something I didn't know before I started this project. You can actually send a file descriptor from one process to another using uh, UDS. So again, we wrote a little utility crate. This one's also public, uh, which allows you to very easily send a file descriptor across process boundaries in Rust. Uh, and then last but not least, we wrote this channel, which uses a ring buffer uh, for the underlying data structure. and so the basics of it are atomics for indexes. We're going to go into that a little bit more later. Uh, and careful memory orderings, very careful. Uh, and then safe wraparound. This one I guarantee is not public yet, but it will, it will be soon. Um, so I want to go over some, like the three main components here. And I'm going to go over both what they contain, the how, how the API looks right now, even though we're planning on making a change to it, and like. Where's the magic, basically? Uh, so the the meat of it is this ring buffer struct. Uh, the number of consumers that you're going to get is statically 
generated. This allows us to have some static guarantee, like allows us to get the compiler to check some different types of code things later on. Ideally, it wouldn't be static, or at least it'd be like a const generic or something. Right now, we use uh, uh, type num for, to do this. Uh, so anyway, so shared, again, is this uh, wrapper around shared memory locations. Uh, so we have this data field size, which is just whatever length you allocated. It is a characteristic of how the ring buffer is written. That your size has to be a power of two. We find that that's actually fine. <laughs> it's not that bad of a restriction. Uh, whether or not a writer has been taken. So one characteristic is that it is multi-consumer, but it is single producer. Uh, I'll talk about that in the end. Uh, how, many writer, how many readers have been given? And then just the phantom data to keep the type signature together. So shared T just means you've put T in that shared memory space that you allocated for it. Uh, oops. Shared C void is a special case where you're basically saying, look, there's this data inside in shared memory, but we don't statically know the actual size of it, uh, which is the case, unfortunately. Uh, and you know what exactly is in there in this code? Uh, so an addendum, I have blatantly plagiarized this from Philip Opperman on his like blog OS series. So thank you for the graph. Uh, I modified it slightly. So basically, what you have is the ring buffer data backing, quote unquote. Is just a contiguous uh, contiguous memory with all the types that you put in it. So I don't know if you have 128 of size, you're going to have space for 128 t. And then the important part is that m in the end. So the m is the metadata for your ring buffer, which also lives in shared memory. Um, it's the magic smoke, so to speak, of NeoBuffer. If you let it escape, everything breaks. Uh, so this is what the metadata looks like. So read count is a U size. Keep that in mind. The reason is that it's immutable, but we'll go back to it uh, also towards the end. So the writer, and, and this is the crucial part, the writer step is an atomic in shared memory. Um, something I didn't know before I started this was that atomics, and this, the same guarantees atomics give you for uh, cross-thread use, they also give you for cross-process use. As long as you keep in mind the uh, memory consistency guarantees of the architecture that you're dealing with. So for us, this project is Linux, AMD 6 to 4. That's it. We're not worrying about ARM or DEC Alpha or nothing crazy. Uh, we, we are not worrying about Windows yet. Uh, it's just Linux and AMD 64, the like most well-known ones. Uh, again, this would probably be increasingly complex on architectures with weaker memory consistency guarantees, such as ARM. Uh, but luckily, AMD 64 has pretty strict consistency guarantees, all things considered. Uh, so it works out fairly well. Um, again, references, which it basically allows the ring buffer to work as an arc. So it drops when all the refer outstanding references to it have been dropped. Uh, is also an atomic because, well, it's being modified by multiple processes. So the API for ring buffer is pretty simple. You can instantiate it. You can get get a sync from it and get a source from it. So it doesn't the the ring buffer itself doesn't really expose uh, insertion or getting data from it or anything. So the sync is very similar. It has a Again, you can think of this shared C void as a pointer, but to shared memory, basically. So it points to the same data in shared memory. Uh, again, the size, uh, the writer step, but this is just a local copy. And the minimum reader, uh, it's like a lower bound or an upper bound, depending on how you look at it, on on the reader step. This is for wraparound protection. while. Like for our use, particular use case, we don't really care about the reader, sorry, the writer overrunning the reader, the slowest reader, because that'll basically mean someone has a jumbled frame, which is fine in the grand scheme of things. But we understand that for the vast majority of cases, you don't want this. So this is actually something we're still working on, what exactly to do. Since you don't ever want the writer to block, what do you exactly do when you have a reader that's stuck in a position that's about to be overrun? I am of the philosophy that you kill it uh, and go on, but I'm open for a discussion. Uh, 
And sync also has a very simple public API. All it lets you do is push. So it'll handle the position for you. It doesn't allow kind of random access into the ring buffer. You just call push and it'll insert into the next position. And uh, these calls are non-blocking, use the NB library. Uh, in the future, we'd like to use futures. Uh, so source is the kind of consumer uh, counterpart to sync. Uh, again, pointer to the same data, size, and then reader ID. The reason we have a reader ID is so we can kind of identify which reader is the slow one. Um, reader step is just your own step. And here you might note something curious, which is the reader step is local to the reader. I'll get to this later when I talk about some of the quirks of NeoBuffer, which are kind of unique to our use of it and that we'd like to kind of get rid of soon. Um, again, minimum write a step, the same um, optimization that provides it with a, a lower bound, and then Phantom data. Uh, the public API is a little bit more complex, but not really. It gives you available size, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, advanced get and pop. So advanced just tells the, just changes the your reader index to say, okay, I'm reading this one now. And get will actually read that data. Uh, and pop is a handy combination of both where it'll advance and read it and then move on. Uh, most of the time you should just probably be using just pop. Uh, there we go. So some of the quirks of NeoBuffer are that consumption is local. What this means is it doesn't work like a, a work stealing thing where you could have like three processes and when one process consumes the data, the other processes no longer can consume that data again. This is not what you want. Again, the kind of motivation for this was to multi-stream video. So everyone has to be able to read the same thing over and over again. This is something we would like to be flexible in the future with. Like, we want you to be able to say, no, I want to actually consume something globally. This isn't that complicated. It just means that the reader step needs to receive the same careful treatment with atomics that the writer step does and needs to live in shared memory. Um, relative indexing, this is, a, this is not a quirk for me. This is just how things should work. But some coworker said that it was weird. So there you go. Like the, the indexing is relative to the position of the head. Um, and it only works on Linux. Uh, this isn't a necessity. Uh, it only works on Linux because we only use Linux. So that's the only thing we bothered with, really. But it could very well work on Mac. That seems relatively simpler. And on Windows, I have no clue. Uh, so if you are a Windows developer and you know about shared memory and file descriptors in Windows and things like this, please come talk to me. I would love to hear about if this could even work in Windows at all. Um, and this is the biggest issue, not you, the user, but us, the maintainers, the memory orderings are very finicky. Um, you have to be like laser precise with how you write your code in this code of NeoBuffer so that you don't get very bizarre bugs about kind of the visibility of the effects of altering atomics between processes. So originally we did what everyone does, we wrote it and we made every single atomic axis sequentially consistent. We're like, all right, this is great. And then uh, Simona's and Leo worked together to get it down to the actual orders that we want. And we actually came, started with the idea that Eddie B proposed to me of like, we could use uh, acquire and release orderings in a certain way on how we do the pops and the pushes so that it would all work. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't really include like the code for this because it's kind of gnarly and it would take too much time. But when it's open source, you can go take a look. Uh, so some results, some benchmarks of how this actually looks. I just put this here for future reference to actually go to human readable numbers. Uh, so assuming four parallel readers, which is for us kind of a worst case scenario really, I don't think we want to be running more than four experiments at a time, and a buffer size of eight, which is tiny, it's horrible. So this is like, Worst case scenario for this, we get 7 million one byte packets per second on this channel. Uh, with a larger buffer, we get about you know 50 million uh, packets per second. And then uh, on the worst case scenario, we got about 300 gigabits per second with two megabyte packages of uh, transfer rates. Uh, for us, this is great. 
Uh, the cameras give about one gigabyte per second, so that means a lot of cameras can go through uh, with no bottleneck whatsoever. Uh, and we think other people might have good uses, use cases for this too, thus the kind of effort into open sourcing this. Uh, just for reference, this was run on Simonis's computer, which has a Ryzen 7 and DDR4 running at 3200 megahertz. Uh, so we, considering, you know, if you, if you want to compare this to a proper like network stack, like the performance you get from just a, a switch, which has like proper hardware acceleration for what it does, it's actually surprisingly good. Uh, Leo gave me some numbers, but I promptly forgot about them. So that's all I can tell you. I remember they were good. <laughs> uh, so future work, things we want to do, and kind of ideas that we have on how we can take this. So when NeoBuffer fails, it can be a bit awkward. We would like for it to be much nicer for when it fails. Um, so we want to sp split pushing in the same way you, you saw that popping was a get and an advance. We want pushing to be similar. This allows us to remove a, a copy or clone from the push process into NeoBuffer. Um, we want to be able to not necessarily use shared memory. So I have no use case for this, but someone said, oh, if I could use this on the just like hard drive, it would be very useful. And I said, why? And they said, I can't tell you. So I mean, someone wants to implement it, we'll, we'll welcome it. <laughs> and multi-producer, multi-consumer. So multi-producer, multi-consumer divides kind of the team that worked on this. I think will be a nightmare and people will drop, die trying to implement it. Uh, Leo says this, the day I tell him he has to implement it, he will die. And Simona says it'll be very simple. So who knows really? If I remember correctly when I asked Eddie B about this a few months ago, he also thought it would be a nightmare. Uh, so we will find out someday. But it would be nice to have the ability to have multi-producers and multi-consumers. Uh, I have no idea how to do it. Uh, futures, right now we use NB, but once Rust has proper support for futures, since this is IO, uh, we would like for it to return like futures. Uh, and global consumption. As I mentioned, consumption is purely local. So we would like for the consumption to become global across all the clients. Uh, not for, we would like that to be an option at least for, for users of our library. Uh, so a summary, uh, NeoBuffer is a lock-free, fast, cross-process channel that uses shared memory. Uh, yeah, it's based off of a ring buffer that has to be two power of two sized uh, in shared memory. Uh, we made some public supporting libraries that we used for it, such as SendFD, Interprocess Traits, that we want to move into the standard library someday, and uh, Shmem, and Atomics to manage the read and write indexes. Uh, oh, yeah, and it, it, it's relatively safe. Uh, what I mean by relatively safe is, as long as you respect the invariance that the documentation tells you very well, which can be summed up very briefly here as don't make a neo buffer of type T and, so and open it in another process with type K. That will go wrong for obvious reasons. So as long as you don't do something like that, you should be fine. Um, I am of the idea that perhaps it should be possible for us to have some sort of runtime error for this. So at runtime, if you try to open a particular NeoBuffer that is of a different type, it will yield you some error. I don't think that's the case right now. It will just do crazy stuff, uh, especially because it will assume that that metadata portion is actually, suppose if it's a bigger type, the metadata portion will end up where the actual types are. So it will just be insane. Don't do it. Uh, so any questions? <laughs> that's it. Hello, nice talk. Not that, is, not that there is anything wrong with that, but is the plan when you open source all those libs to accept patches for cross-platform support and stuff like that? Or is it just, we did this, if you want to add stuff, fork it and... No, uh, uh, the plan is to support it. At least, um, I don't think standard cognition per se has a commitment to support it, but I have, so. Nice. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe it's a stupid question, but just for me to understand, uh, when I have a consumer and I call pop, will that call kind of like block until there's new data available in the buffer for me? Or how does that work? Um, so originally, again, this was, to, this was implemented three times. Uh, the first implementation was just undefined behavior. The whole thing was like a thousand lines of undefined behavior that worked. Uh, then we made it like defined behavior, and then we made it nicer. Uh, so in the original code, if you try to say, uh, so basically what you're asking is you're trying to the reader to wrap around the writer. In the original version, it would so the read calls return an, an our result uh, or an option, either or, and it would return you either none or an error. I don't remember how we did it back then. So our Opinion right now is that now that futures are begin beginning to mature, we would like for it to block and wait. Of course, it would be also nice to have a non-blocking uh, variation of that API where it just gives you a none. Uh, we, I would be happy to see both live side by side. Yeah, I think they are not mutually exclusive. Nice talk. Um, with, um, with the Git repo, uh, sh shmem itself, do you mean system five shared memory as a CS call? What, what's underneath? Uh, so on Linux, we, I, so we start originally, the first version, I'll go back again through the history. First version, all it did was it created a file in slash dev slash shm, uh, which is equivalent to having a file in your RAM. Uh, and then that file was accessed by processes. So we did we we had path files with path. Uh, it, it became kind of clear that that was a security issue and also an ergonomic issue. Uh, so we, when we moved to the the pathless files, we moved to the MMFD syscall. I see. Thank you. And another question: um, Can you uh, could you please explain again a little bit how the processes are? Um, how I mean, what's Camd is listening for? And uh, where does it get the data exactly? And how it and how the uh, other processes around it are uh, orchestrated? Ah, so NeoBuffer doesn't concern itself much with process orchestration. Um, the only orchestration that you get from NeoBuffer is it will wait until there is data. Uh, again, if you have fast readers, uh, which is our case, our readers are pretty fast. We don't have like we 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 don't we basically don't have the issue where the writer will overrun a, uh, a, a reader. Doesn't happen for us. If you have fast readers, this basically means your, pro your number of processes consuming because the consumption is, is local are always kind of on the same step in the ring buffer. Now, if you were to have slow readers, I don't really know uh, what would happen. Uh, but so uh, you, what was the other part of your question, I'm sorry? Yeah, I mean, how, how CAMD, uh, how is it used inside CAMD and how do they, ah, uh, wh so where does CAMD yeah. takes the data from? CAMD, you, so uh, when, when I started CAMD, I hadn't thought of this. So I decided to use ZMQ for the protocol for clients to talk to CAMD. So basically it works like this. Uh, the client tells CAMD, hello, can you stream camera with IP, blah, 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 blah. So CAMD will see that the camera exists, do whatever it needs to do to start getting video from it. Then it will create a neo buffer, and then uh, spawn a uh, get a, a, a source. No, so, sorry, get a sync, and then pass that sync, which implements a send, to another uh, thread that will just read the camera and shove uh, push the frames into the the sync. So then chemd the like struct keeps a hash map of IPs to uh, Syncs and or sorry to the ring buffer struct and whenever when this after this is all said and done you basically ask uh, Give me a handle to the stream that you opened and it will go into the hash map find the ring buffer get the File descriptor basically the shared portion and then we use one of those supporting crates send FD to open a Unix domain socket between the two processes Pass the file the file descriptor across, and then open up NeoBuffer. Is it very ergonomic? No, but it allows us to keep the old ZMQ thing that we had in place already, and people are expecting it to. 
if you build your system with the expectation that you'll be using NeoBuffer, you can do it in a much more uh, reasonable way. Like Tokyo, for example, has a Unix domain socket like module, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and you, you could pass, pass the file descriptors like that. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, have you found a way to uh, test the interaction between atomic operations across several processes, or did you just find a solution that works for you and you didn't ever touch that code again in your life? <laughs> so that, that I did that because I was afraid. Uh, Simone has actually went down in the weeds, and he, he knows a lot about like AMD64 atomics behavior. Uh, all I know is like sequentially consistent is your friend. Uh, you know, it, just go with that as as long as you can, and then when you can't, call someone else, call an adult. Uh, and so he he actually went into weeds and figured out like, I don't know, he he wrote me like a huge thing explaining like, no, we're gonna do uh, acquire re uh, acquire when we do the read on the, to see that the data is there, and then we do a release reading when we update it. He has this whole like theory to, on how it work. And then eventually we'll be, we've, we've, we're using it in production right now. Uh, it worked. So we're like, I guess he was right. Thank you. Hey, thank you.